and welcome to this special event of the Centre for Independent Studies to mark the sealing of Magna Carta 800 years ago today. In fact, we're trying to work out the time. I think it was done about noon or thereabouts, so we're sort of close to sealing time. Um, I think it's wonderful that such a foundational document in the history of our political and legal institutions and some other things can still be talked about so long after that and that today and in the past few weeks and in the weeks to come, events like this are being held. Some of, some of what it contains, of course, is pretty old fashioned, fairly pedestrian and a creature of its times. For instance, Clause 35 is concerned with uniform measures for serving ale. Very important for sure, but some of the issues that dealt with all that time ago are also alive today and in many place, in, and in many places, and that's a pretty good reason for remembering its importance. But then again, today, June 15th, is also Beer Day in the United Kingdom. So, so even the pedestrian measures still resonate. In fact, there's all sorts of Magna Carta ale being brewed, especially for today. Several years ago, I happened to find my way to Runnymede where the Great Charter was sealed and thought I'd get a copy to hang somewhere in the CIS. I presumed, wrongly as it turns out, that there'd be a significant memorial with attached souvenir shop where I could get what I was after. Eventually I found some tea rooms. Uh, they did sell some souvenirs and in a basket in a corner on the floor, there it was. Well now it hangs proudly on the wall as you get out of the lift at CIS. Tonight we have two main presentations by Jim Spiegelman and Christian Porter with a few introductory remarks by Nicholas Clark, CEO of the Rule of Law Institute of Australia and project director of the Institute's Magna Carta Committee. And this uh, these banners here and the ones down there are all part of his responsibilities. And there'll be some concluding remarks by senior fellow, uh, CIS senior fellow Barry Maley. We've just published a paper by Barry uh, on Magna Carta. It's called Magna Carta, uh, Magna Carta, Talisman of Liberty. And if you want a copy, you can buy one out there for $10. For those of you who don't know the CIS very well, here's my little advertisement for tonight. We're an independent, privately supported, public policy research organisation. Magna Carta might be 800, but we turn 40 next year, and that in itself is not a bad achievement. We're entirely supported by voluntary contributions of individuals, companies, and philanthropic organisations. If you're not already a member or a supporter, we'd welcome your involvement so we can continue to hold events like this uh, and to research and publish the extensive ra range of material that we do. Information is on your seat, and you may get the full picture at our website, cis.org.au. It's a great time to become a supporter as the financial year concludes pretty soon and you can strike a blow for freedom and deprive the government of a little tax by helping us. I, must also, I might also say at this point how much we appreciate the assistance of the National Australia Bank by the hosting of this event tonight and, and providing refreshments as you've already had and afterwards. It's a great room. Um, we, were, we often hold our events up at St Leonard's and we can hold about 100 and something people but we way exceeded that. Jim Spiegelman is well known to all of you, I'm sure. He was Chief Justice and Lieutenant Governor of New South Wales from 1998 to 2011, and has served with distinction in many roles in legal, political, and cultural organisations, including Chair of the National Library, as a board member of the Australian Film Finance Corporation, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, as President of the Museum of, of uh, Applied Arts and Sciences, and of course, he is currently Chairman of the ABC. In 2013, he was appointed a non-permanent judge at the court, the court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong. Christian Porter was elected to the Federal Parliament in, at the 2013 election for the Western Australian seat of Pearce. Prior to this, he served as a minister uh, in the state government, variously holding the portfolios of Attorney General, uh, Minister of Corrective Services and Treasurer of Western Australia. In December last year, he was sworn in as Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister Immediately before entering federal parliament, he was professor of law at Curtin University and has also taught at the University of Western Australia and at Edith Cowan University. So before I hand over to Nicholas Clark, who will say a few things, here's a little bit of something from Rudyard Kipling to help set the scene. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, your rights were won at Runnymede. No freeman shall be fined or bound or dispossessed of freehold ground except by lawful judgment found and passed upon him by his peers. Forget not, after all these years, the charter, he said, signed, charter signed at Runnybead. <coughs> and remember it, we will. Nick.
First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to the Centre for Independent Studies for allowing the Rule of Law Institute to bring along um, part of its uh, uh, Magna Carta celebration to this event. Um, the Rule of Law Institute is responsible for the banners you see um, here and the little display at the back. Also, the poster on your chair. I just want to talk about this poster for a second. Um, it's a copy of our replica of a 1215 Magna Carta. It's the Magna Carta from Salisbury Cathedral in the UK. Um, I've coloured in some of the clauses um, in the text so you can look at the translations down the bottom. What the Rule of Law Institute is really about um, is taking the principles and ideas that are in something like Magna Carta and talking about them in schools. Um, my background is um, as a high school teacher and the institute employs uh, three teachers. We go around and talk about um, not just you know, historical legal documents, but we go into schools and talk about ideas like the presumption of innocence, um, threats to the independence of the judiciary, um, and all those kind of um, ideas that really find foundation in Magna Carta. Um, so, this, um, I was delighted when um, the Prime Minister giving a speech today um, at the event of Parliament House mentioned that there was an MP um, that objected to Parliament House buying um, Australia's copy of the 1297 Magna Carta. He suggested that um, they send a poster um, of Magna Carta to every single student in the Commonwealth. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to uh, offer our poster to you um, as something that you can use to start a conversation about uh, Magna Carta. Um, I've picked four of the clauses of Magna Carta that I feel are really important um, to us today and something that we should be having uh, conversations about, but especially having conversations um, about with young people. Thanks a lot. I'd like now to invite Jim Spiegelman to address us. Thank you, Jim. <coughs> Thank you, Greg. Uh, Rajar Kipling's altogether too serious. Perhaps I could start with Tony Hancock, who once said, uh, Magna Carta, Magna Carta, that wonderful Hungarian peasant girl, let her rest in peace. <laughs> anyway, the, <coughs> the document to which King John affixed his seal on this day 800 years ago was intended to be a peace treaty to end a civil war. As such, it failed. Within two months, the king repudiated it and the pope declared it void. The civil war reignited. However, John died about a year later and an amended version of the charter was issued as a coronation charter in the name of his nine-year-old son, Henry III, on his accession in October 1216. This reissue of the Magna Carta was in a long line of promises of good governance traditionally given by a king on his coronation. Historically, when the monarchy was strong, the coronation oath was short and expressed in general terms. When the monarchy was weak, a more detailed list of promises was required and given. The final reissue by Henry III in 1225 of the Magna Carta, about a third of the 1215 text had gone, and its companion, the Forest Charter, to the significance of which I will return, was not just a formal act, nor was it simply a list of grievances to be remedied. By reason of their scope and detail, together with the endorsement by the loyalist barons, the charters constituted the first comprehensive statement in written form, formally promulgated to the whole English population, of the requirements of good governance and of the limits upon the exercise of political power. I am asked to concentrate and focus in this address on the significance of the Magna Carta for the rule of law and liberty. My answer to the first is forthright. We can legitimately trace the strength of our tradition of the rule of law to this document. With respect to liberty, however, the position is equivocal. The Charter has often been deployed in support of the development of liberties, but that deployment was at best indirect. The liberties often associated with the Magna Carta were a product of the institutions of Parliament and the courts over the course of centuries. However, the development of those institutions was significantly influenced by the Magna Carta. At the heart of English constitutional evolution, particularly in the six centuries between the Norman invasion of 1066 
and the aftermath of the Dutch invasion of 1688, uh, English historians didn't used to refer to that as an invasion, but that's what it was, was the tension between the alternative bases for the legitimacy of the institutions of governance. On the one hand was a top-down model of legitimacy from a sovereign. On the other was organic legitimacy from the emergence of institutions over the course of centuries. The Magna Carta and the Forest Charter stand in and propagate the tradition of organic legitimacy. They draw on and purport to reassert the customs of the past. However, the Charters also contain promises about future conduct which were reforms. The Magna Carta of 1215 is expressed as a grant issued on the advice, in older translations of the Council, of 11 named ecclesiastics, 16 named lay barons, and an unknown number of unnamed, quote, faithful subjects, unquote. The last inclusion is of significance. Indeed, the first clause of the Charter states expressly that the promises in the subsequent clauses are liberties granted to, I quote, all the free men of our realm, unquote, for the benefit of, them, benefit of themselves and their heirs, binding King John and his heirs forever. This was a document for the entire political nation, not just for the secular and clerical magnates. Both, however, both the language of grant and the identification of the political nation are pregnant with future constitutional development. Was this list of political promises an act of benevolence on the part of the king, or was it an acknowledgement of, by the king of restraints on sovereignty arising from custom and law? Similarly, who is entitled to offer counsel to the king, the clerical and secular magnates alone, or a wider range of free men? This issue, these issues would not be resolved for centuries. In the great tradition of the common law, the Magna Carta is an intensely practical document. There are a few statements of high principle. Primar primarily, it consists of specific promises to restore compliance with proper conduct. One can, however, deduce certain themes which underline the charter, underlie the charter. First, the acts of the king are not simply personal acts. The king's acts have an official character and accordingly are to be exercised in accordance with certain processes. Secondly, the charter manifests the obligation of the king to consult the political nation on important issues. Thirdly, the charter restricts the exercise of the king's feudal powers subsequently transmogrified into prerogative powers in accordance with traditional limits and conceptions of propriety. Fourthly, the king cannot act on the basis of mere whim. The king is subject to the law and also subject to custom, which was during that very period in the process of being hardened into law. Fifthly, the king had in fact acted contrary to established custom and to some degree contrary to the law. Sixthly, the king must provide a judicial system for the administration of justice, and all free men were entitled to due process of law. The principles inherent in these underlying themes were not established by the Magna Carta. However, they were affirmed by its content and context in a concrete form. It is these themes, as developed and applied in changing circumstances over the centuries, that gave the Charter the significance we commemorate today. The reissues and confirmations of the charters were distributed widely throughout the kingdom to sheriffs and cathedrals with instructions that they be read, sometimes more than once a year, to the whole community. This happened not only in Latin but French, the language of the upper classes, and there is some evidence that on occasions they were read in English. The charters quickly penetrated the consciousness of the political nation. Whatever their limitations and problems of enforcement, over the course of the first century, the Magna Carta and the Companion Forest Charter acquired a totemic status as a statement of principles of good governance. The King was asked to confirm the Charter on numerous occasions, uh, at one count over 50, particularly when assent was sought for new taxation. Furthermore, grievances were generally ex expressed in terms of a failure to obey the Charters. From the point of view of the rule of law, nothing was more critical than the proposition that the king was subject to the law. This principle was not established by the Charter, but there was no previous written affirmation, let alone one publicly read many times throughout the nation. The most important legal text of the next two centuries asserted this proposition as fundamental to the polity, albeit without referring to the Magna Carta. 
These are the works known to lawyers as Bracton and Fortescue. The Magna Carta was invoked when a king asserted that he was above law. Richard II did that, and all of the Stuarts. Shakespeare made it clear in his Richard II that his assertion, that this assertion, was part of Richard II's downfall. He did not mention that Henry Bolingbroke invoked the Magna Carta. Indeed, Shakespeare could write King John, a play about King John, without mentioning the Charter. Victorian theatre producers introduced a Runnymede scene as something the Bard had inadvertently overlooked. It was not a favourite text of either the Tudors or the Stuarts. After all, one of the few times it was invoked under the Tudors was when Thomas More pleaded Clause 1, guaranteeing the liberties of the Church before Henry VIII. It was Sir Edward Cook, in reaction to the Stuarts, who invested the Magna Carta with the mythological status, status which has been handed down to us today. There is, however, nothing mythical about the proposition that the Magna Carta reinforced, even if it did not establish, the fundamental principle that the king was subject to the law. The largest number of clauses of the Magna Carta in all versions were those directed to preventing the king's abuse of incidents of feudal ten tenure and social structure to raise revenue. Of the 37 clauses of the 1225 version, which I use because of its permanence, 20 were concerned with such abuses. All of these uh, provisions, either imposed or to an unknown extent confirmed, restrictions on the exercise of powers that were a product of the complex of mutual rights and obligations attached to the possession of land, which was then held from a superior rather than owned. There was a range of such powers which were open to exploitation by the king. Abuse was inherent in a system that permitted when and how much the king could demand in payment for exercising or not exercising his feudal rights. I'll give only a few examples. When a tenant in chief died, the land reverted to the king from which it was held. There was no formal limit on how long the king could exploit the land before allowing an heir to inherit, nor on how much he could charge to permit him to do so. Similarly, with the amount payable to allow a widow or a ward to marry, or the amount payable to avoid the obligation to provide knights or many other, and there are many other feudal payments that could be requested from time to time in the discretion of the king. In addition to these incidents of land holding, there were numerous other discretionary sources of revenue, fines for an offence, even payments for the king's mercy when there was no offence, and the assertion that circumstances arisen when property could be forfeited, not just for treason, but for other offences. All of these powers were abused by King John. The same was true of the revenue raised from the extent of the royal forest and the restrictions on conduct within it, the subject of the forest charter. It would be accurate to describe the baronial rebellion against John as in large part a tax revolt. The provisions of both charters restraining the abuse of the king's powers for the purpose of raising revenue manifest the proposition that the king was subject to the law. This was and is at the very core of the rule of law. The majority of provisions of the Magna Carta require this king to cease or modify particular conduct. The most significant field in which the charter requires the king to do more rather than less is in the provision of justice. The Magna Carta contains a range of promises directed to preventing abuses and improving the institutions of the rule of law. Their very scope manifests an intention to benefit the whole community. Cases involving interpersonal dispute, known as common pleas, uh, would not follow the ambulatory royal court but be fixed in a particular place, eventually Westminster. That's clause, uh, clause 11. I won't mention the clause numbers. Disputes relating to the ownership of land would be heard in the counties in which the land was located and determined by visiting justices sitting with local knights. Royal justices would visit annually. Uh, originally, it was four times a year in 1215, but in the final version, annually, to hear the most common causes of action for recovery of land and inheritance. Fines for offences would be extracted only for serious offences, would vary with the gravity of the offence and would be imposed only off the, on the oath of law-abiding locals. Pleas of the Crown, that is serious criminal charges, would not be heard by sheriffs, constables or coroners, but only by justices. Constables and bailiffs would not take private property without full payment in cash. Sheriffs and bailiffs, or for that matter any other person, would not take horses or carts 
say on payment of a prescribed amount, nor any timber except by consent. The writ of precipice would no longer issue to remove to a royal court a cause of action which is properly before the court of a lord. No bailiff would put anyone on trial upon his own word without reliable witnesses, and the frequency of shire courts was regulated as was the amount sheriffs could exact in the hundred courts from the system known as Frank Pledge. This, other than the restraint on fiscal exactions, this was the second largest body of clauses in the Magna Carta in all its versions. Many of these provisions appear to be promises of reform rather than assertions of past custom. However, writing them down made those which were customly more readily enforceable. These promises constituted a guarantee of the rule of law appropriate for that era. Collectively, they built on the foundation of the existing institutions of justice, uh, particularly as created by Henry II, John's father. This, well, these royal courts were only about 40 years old at this time. And this established the basis for their future development. We can recognise this guarantee as our direct legacy. The best known promise and the one of abiding significance for the rule of law throughout the 800 years we commemorate today is Clause 29 of the 1225 Charter. It is an amalgamation of Clauses 39 and 40 of the 1215 Charter. It states, no free man is to be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his free tenement, deceased means losing his right to land, or of his liberties or free customs, or outlawed or exiled in any way be ruined, nor will we go or send against him, namely send in the nights, except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. Like a number of other clauses, this provision is expressly addressed to all free men, not just barons. It is wrong to say, as is sometimes said, that the Magna Carta was only designed to protect the barons. Nevertheless, it is pertinent to note that only a minority of the population were free men. The bulk of the population was not free. Only Clause 14 of the 1225 Charter, imposing restrictions on immersements, that is, payments in lieu of um, uh, affair, fines for imprisonment, ex that only that clause expressly extended to villains. However, in the 14th century, the statutes of Edward III extended the protection in Clause 29 to the whole population. The better, albeit not unanimous, view is uh, that the reference to judgment of peers was a reference to social equals, not just to barons. It was soon called in aid by mere knights. Furthermore, notwithstanding many statements to the contrary that can be traced back to Sir Edward Cook, Clause, 20, uh, sorry, clause 29, a bit of a running repair here, um, was not the basis for the development of the jury system. The event of 1215 that caused the investigative jury or grand jury in modern parlance to develop into the petty or later the trial jury was the decision of the Lateran Council in Rome that very year <clears throat> to prohibit any priest being involved in trial by ordeal. Um, ordeal meant, you know, you were put at the bottom of a, um, of a river or a lake with a stone wrapped around you, and if you rose to the top, you were guilty. Uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> The implementation of the Companion Forest Charter was of equal significance for the rule of law. <clears throat> the Royal Forest was not an area of minor significance. It is estimated that between one quarter and one third of the whole of England was part of the Royal Forest. This forest was not simply woodland. It encompassed cultivated areas, even villages, which were privately held. Forest law trumped common law. The draconian rules of the forest, governing virtually anything that people could do in this substantial part of the nation, including on their own property, was administered in a tyrannical manner. It constituted an abuse of the royal prerogative in its most absolutist form. This is the background of the story of Robin Hood, still the only fictional character in the Dictionary of National Biography. The Forest Charter did result <clears throat> in improvements in the administration of forest law. For example, the death penalty for taking deer was abolished, although deer hunting remained the exclusive preserve of the kings, and you still had to get permission to hunt rabbits and pigs from the, from the king. The promise to reduce the extent of the royal forest was continually delayed until late in the reign of Edward I. 
It will no doubt come as a great shock to this audience to hear that in medieval times, political promises were not always kept. <laughs> it took a century, but these promises were eventually honoured. <clears throat> From the point of view of the majority of the population, not just free men, the forest charter was of greater practical significance than the Magna Carta. Much of the forest was a commons, including for timber, which was the essential fuel and building material, available even to peasants. The, uh, the forest charter deserves to be more widely remembered for its significant contribution to the rule of law in England. I might say that it was still on the books until the early 70s when it was superseded by contemporary environmental legislation. The combined effect of the restraint on the ability of the king to extract revenue by abuse of feudal incidents and by the enforcement of the forest charter resulted in a major containment of royal revenue. The development of parliament out of the feudal assemblies which were called to agree to periodic royal taxation was a direct result of this curtailment. Whenever assent was given by the political nation to new taxation in the first century after the charters, by Henry III and Edward I, John's son and grandson, they confirmed the two charters as part of an express exchange for a new tax. The Magna Carta is often referred to as a charter of liberties. The Latin word, usually translated as liberties, appears on a number of occasions in the charter. However, the word liberties was not then understood in the sense that we use the word rights. It was closest to what we would call privileges and immunities. Nevertheless, these medieval liberties constituted a sphere of autonomous conduct, free from constraint by government, and in that sense constituted freedoms close to contemporary usage. The charters contained a list of restraints on executive power addressing the abuses of the day. What came down over the centuries, however, was the general idea that the power of the sovereign, well, powers of the sovereign were restricted. <clears throat> it is anachronistic to characterise these restrictions as a recognition of the rights of subjects. However, the, over the course of centuries, these liberties have transmogrified into rights. As the Lancastrian warrior turned Chief Justice, Sir John Fortescue, <clears throat> put it in the late 15th century, in France the king was regal, but in England the king was both regal and political. It is possible to eke out of particular provisions of the Charter an underlying principle which could be stated at a higher level of generality than the time-bound grievances expressly addressed. For example, protection of the right to property can be deduced from the provisions which restrict to the King's revenue generating powers. <clears throat> Many clauses impose controls on such powers, usually in general terms but sometimes in detail, with amounts stipulated, circumstances of imposition excluded, or a standard of reasonableness or of custom expressed. Further, the principle of no expropriation without compensation can be inferred from specific restraints on sheriffs and bailiffs from taking property uh, with compensation, and in the case of horse carts, stipulating a particular rate. The Companion Forest Charter similarly removed some restrictions on what people could do on their own land. Other traditional liberties are more difficult to identify in the Charter. One must not overlook those parts of the Magna Carta that are inconsistent with liberty. For example, one provision expressly forbids a woman to give evidence in any case against a person for murder unless the deceased happens to be her husband when presumably even a woman could be believed. <clears throat> the 1215 Charter prohibited the payment of interest on debts owed to Jews in certain circumstances. This clause was not repeated in the 1225 Charter, but that did nothing about existing discrimination derived from the combined effect of usury restrictions on Christians lending money and the restrictions on Jews engaging in other economic activity, for example, the prohibition on any Jew owning land, or holding land, owning is not the right word. Jews were protected by the king as a source of federal revenue, or of feudal revenue. Federal feudal. <laughs> <coughs> there's, there's, yes, there's something Freudian about that slip. Uh, for example, when a Jewish lender died, the king expropriated his rights as a creditor. Indeed, when Edward I, popular acclaim, ordered the expulsion of all Jews, he was expressly compensated for his loss of revenue by an additional tax. It's also necessary to remember the restrictions on liberty about which the Charter offered no amelioration. 
A substantial proportion of the population was held in a condition of slavery and remained so. People were still executed for heresy for some three centuries, and the executive continued to detain subject at will and to deploy torture in interrogations for four centuries. It was also four centuries before any intrusion was made into the restrictions on freedom of religion and freedom of expression, and it was well into the 19th century before Roman Catholics and Jews had equal civil rights. Homosexuals had to wait for another century. In the actual control of the exercise of executive power, the courts were constrained until the Act of Settlement of 1701 took away the power of the king to remove a judge from office at will, as James I removed Cook as Chief Justice. With respect to human rights, the Magna Carta was not much of a start. But by entrenching the rule of law and promoting the expansion of royal courts, it created the institutional basis for the future expansion of personal liberties by Parliament and the courts. Although the constitutional impact of the Magna Carta was greater, greatest in its first century and in the 17th century, it was of more consistent significance for the legal system. The charters were referred to in legal proceedings on a minimum of 58 occasions in their first century in courts. Furthermore, in an era when the quantum of litigation increased dramatically, the Magna Carta became a basic tool of the legal profession. It was no doubt in large measure its concreteness as a text that facilitated reference to its provisions for purposes of litigation. The charters acquired the status of a statute, and at the end of the century, the Magna Carta became the first statute in the official role of statute when that was first created. A good representation of the use of the charter by lawyers is found in a 1330, remember it was introduced as a statute only in uh, the 1300, we, in, there's a 1330 printed compilation of 20 statutes commencing with the Magna Carta and the Forest Charter presently on display in the State Library of New South Wales. This antiquarian volume in its original binding was probably the property of a practicing lawyer for use when on circuit throughout England and Wales. This is a physical embodiment of the rule of wa law at work in the technology of that era. The version in the statute book was the 1297 confirmation by Edward I of the 1225 Magna Carta. The copy in our Parliament House is one of only four surviving copies of that 1297 confirmation. Because that is the version which acquired the formal status of a statute, it has been of greater practical importance than the 1215 Charter. Uh, it is appropriate to note what a good investment the Menzies government made when it bought our copy for £12,500 in 1951. In 2007, the only copy of the 1297, 1297 confirmation in private hands sold at auction for US $21.3 million. A classic example of the significant, I mean, it's up there with uh, the Endeavour Diaries, which uh, Bruce bought, or for that matter, it's probably up there in terms of escalation with blue poles. A classic example of the significance of the Magna Carta was its deployment in the conflict between the Stuarts and Parliament arising from the historic Five Nights case, culminating in the Petition of Right of 1628. After failing to obtain additional taxation from his first Parliament in 1626, Charles I dissolved Parliament and proceeded to raise funds without parliamentary approval by way of a forced loan. A number of subjects refused to advance the funds demanded by this executive measure and were imprisoned without charge by the Privy Council acting as a prerogative court. They were refused bail on the basis of an assertion on the part of the prosecution that the King had an absolute right as a matter of state necessity to keep anyone in prison without giving reasons. Some of the accused wanted to force the prosecution to state that the only reason was their refusal to pay the loan, there, thereby manifesting its illegality. Almost without precedent, five of them applied to a common law court by habeas corpus to challenge the order of the Privy Council. In an interlocutory hearing for release on habeas corpus, a, corpus, a weak-kneed court appeared to give credence to the power to imprison without stated cause. The case turned on this crucial issue of personal liberty and on the principle of legality. The prosecution wanted to avoid an express statement that imprisonment was based on a demand for money that had no lawful basis. 
Submissions for the Knights explicitly invoke the Magna Carta, namely the general words of Clause 29, preventing imprisonment other than in accordance with the law. The great lawyer, John Selden, submitted that the, quote, the law of the land, unquote, in Clause 29, must mean due process as understood by the common law. In response of the failure of the court to act, the House of Co Commons drafted what eventually became the Petition of Right of 1628. Drawing on the Magna Carta, together with, with its elaboration in statutes of Edward III, the House demanded that the King's knowledge, that the King acknowledge that no person could be imprisoned without cause shown. In the course of the interchange between the Commons and the House of Lords, the latter appeared to support the King's position by inserting a qualification in the draft, adding the words, quote, saving the King's sovereign power, close quote. In his vehement reply, Sir Edward Cook declaimed, and I quote, sovereign power is no parliamentary word. In my opinion, it weakens the Magna Carta. Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign, end of quote. As Cook often had to do, he offered a weak explanation of why he had not always applied these principles when he was a judge, let alone when he was the Crown's chief prosecutor as Attorney General. After much, he signed a number of torture applications and supervised them. After much prevarication, the Americans don't recognise this, they still regard him as an unsullied hero. After much prevarication, the kings accept the petition and the ability of the executive to deprive citizens of liberty without cause, henceforth, became illegal. Acceptance of the petition, which encompassed some other rights, was celebrated throughout the nation with bonfires and the like. It was a constitutional moment, although there was still much work for the judiciary to do in developing the writ of habeas corpus. This is only one, albeit dramatic, example of how the general words and underlying themes of the Magna Carta were given content over the course of the centuries. The Charter became a myth in the sense that it has been invested with a scope and with purposes that none of its progenitors could ever have envisaged. However, it was a myth of great historical significance. As one of the greatest common law judges of our time, the late Tom Bingham, the former senior law lord, put it, the significance of Magna Carta lay not only in what it actually said, but perhaps to an even greater extent in what later generations claimed and believed it had said. Sometimes the myth is more important than the actuality. The principle of the rule of law and of due process inherent in Clause 29 of the Magna Carta was developed by incremental steps. What we came to know as civil liberties or in earlier centuries as the rights of Englishmen were the practical manifestations of experience of the law over the centuries as manifest in judicial uh, decisions and in legislation. There's virtually no aspect of the trial process that does not manifest these considerations. Equally important for the protection of liberty are the principles of statutory interpretation. There's a strong presumption that Parliament does not intend to abrogate basic rights, freedoms or, Im or immunities Statute will only be found to do so if the language is unambiguous. A few years ago, I compiled a list of specific circumstances, some dozens of circumstances, where this presumption had been applied. In my opinion, this list constituted a common law bill of rights. With some support from Parliament, these protections emerge from a process of induction based on experience, rather than deduction from an abstract level of language. This was judicial creativity before it became to be derided as activism. This characteristic English approach to the development of the law was frequently in tension with and often in competition with an approach based on natural law. However, many lawyers, including Cook and Blackstone, invoked both. The 17th century revival of the Magna Carta led by Cook deployed it as a text which reflected what he asserted was an ancient constitutionalism of custom extant in England from time immemorial. This, like most of Cook's antiquarianism, for example, his espousal of the myth that King Arthur's ancestors came from Troy, was and is nonsense. Nevertheless, the Magna Carta stands in the organic tradition of the common law. The contemporary human rights movement is based on the alternative jurisprudential tradition of natural law. The utility of the Charter is not only historical, the proclivity of the executive branch to manifest intolerance of anything that frustrates its will 
was never limited to the Stuarts, either before or since. An overweening confidence in the purity of their motives appears to be an occupational hazard of executive power. Indeed, Oliver Cromwell rejected constraints on his authority when he had it, dismissing the Magna Carta contemptuously as Magna Fata. No doubt even stronger language was used in the White House about litigation over Guantanamo Bay. Strong language on such issues, it appears, is not unknown in the deliberations of our own cabinet. This will not, regrettably, be the last time that it is appropriate to celebrate the anniversary of the Magna Carta. Thank you.